Okay, guys, here we go. A tale of two Greek cities as opposed to a tale of two cities. Hey, extra credit opportunity right off the bat. Uh, who is the author of A Tale of Two Cities? And what are the two cities? Look that up. Shoot it to me. I'll put this um, video in as an assignment. And you can do extra credit like we did on the last one. Okay. Let's look at our two cities. The first of which is Athens. This is sort of the development of a typical a typical uh, Greek city-state. And let's see what the typical pattern is. Okay. We see the rise of the aristocracy, those wealthy land people, the guys who had the cavalry, uh, were first popular, you know, needed rather for uh, battle, and they saw themselves as better than everybody else. Okay, they take control. Okay, and there's growing tension, especially later with that uh, hoplite phalanx and the idea that maybe uh, those guys aren't as important as the rest of us to be in the phalanx, uh, and so. Um, we see Athens becoming more involved in trade and less involved in that idea of colonization than some of the other city-states we've talked about in the past, uh, trying to really that um, issue of too many people and not enough food. They do more trading and trading things for food than they do actual colonization themselves. Okay, They have a situation where they have a set of people, uh, a ruling kind of a council uh, of lawgivers versus having tyrants take control. Uh, because they have less of uh, turmoil actually in their city, although they have tension between the classes, less actual political turmoil in their, their city-state than others. Okay, They eventually develop a liberal democracy. That's that idea of citizenship based on land ownership, as we talked about earlier. Uh, and eventually this will get to democracy, except, of course, for women, uh, slaves, and everyone else who's a non-citizen, a vast majority of the population. 10 to 20 percent of the population ends up being citizens with those kinds of citizenship rights. Okay, Sparta, this is our other side, our other of the two Greek cities. They have an atypical situation going on there. In other words, not typical. Okay, they have a lack of colonization also. They rely on conquest, taking over their neighbors to get the land and food supplies that they need. Okay. They, however, have to control these conquered people, the helots that they have. And Spartan society basically becomes a situation where it's a prison state and the Spartans themselves are the prison guards always on duty uh, to control those people and keep them from having rights means we as Spartans actually have fewer rights as well. Okay? They're separated by geography from the rest of uh, other city-states in, in Greece. They're out on that Peloponnesian pen Peninsula, that big peninsula, but a very narrow strip of land that connects it to the rest of actual Greece. Okay? There are two classes, the Spartans themselves and the conquered people and slaves, basically, uh, are two different uh, part of the second class. Uh, the conquered people, those helots, are sort of like state-owned slaves doing work and things for people. Okay? The government comes frozen at that king aristocrat stage, and they have that two kings in charge. The idea of still having um, a very decisive, powerful leadership, but by having two, make sure hopefully that there's no corruption going on. Okay, their lifestyle is very harsh. Their young kids go in the military uh, as early as age seven. Uh, they expect to even get enough food to feed themselves, besides this black gruel that they had to eat. Uh, very harsh lifestyle, okay? In fact, you may remember that quote, the mother saying to the sons, it's better to come home on your shield than without it. In other words, we would rather see you die in battle than surrendering of your shield and come home alive, okay? And in the end, this is a situation where these guys are basically, you know, admired by everybody else, but not copied because nobody wants to live like that. Okay, now we're getting into our philosophers and start off with our philosophers and philosophy. We're going to start off with the sophists and we talked about them a little bit in class, uh, more I think in fifth hour than other classes, but uh, these are these traveling teachers. These guys taught argument, okay? It's more about winning the argument than actually being right, okay? Which is the opposite of rhetoric, okay? In Greek society, everyone had to defend themselves in court, okay? And rhetoric is this idea that argumentation relies on logic and logic appeal. So this because of this, and I can show the connections. Sophists are more about simply winning the argument than being logical or even, for that matter, being right. Okay? As I said, winning is more important to them than the truth. Uh, rhetoric, on the other hand, says, hey, is, uh, these guys are actually only known, rather the sophists, only known through those folks who tried to uh, discredit them. They didn't write down a lot of stuff themselves that survived. Okay? 
Some of their stuff could be uh, confusing, illogical, or insincere. To make a point, if it confuses you and throws you off your game and gives us an advantage, that's perfectly okay. okay? Again, this is not a formal school, but a term applied to a traveling teacher who taught argumentation. And as I mentioned in class, sometimes because they actually trained both sides of the same court case, and when they found out about it, yeah, you got to travel, you got to leave, come back some other time. Okay. Our first great philosopher, however, is going to be this guy right here, Socrates. Not Socrates, that's Bill and Ted's excellent adventure, Socrates. Okay. He served with honor in the military. Okay, did his job, did his term time when he needed to. Okay, but by the time he becomes famous as a philosopher, he's seen as a crazy old man. Okay, he taught in the streets. He's wandering around asking people questions, uh, eavesdropping on conversations, getting involved in conversations, uh, sort of pestering people. And this is going to get him in trouble later on. Okay, he says he's the wisest because I know how little I know. He knew how little he knew. That's what he says. And this idea is that. By knowing the limits of what I know, even if it's more than anybody else, that's what makes me wise. Okay? He's the guy that develops that thing you so hate about teachers, okay? the Socratic method, question and answer. You know how it is. You ask your teacher a question and we answer it with a question. Well, we're not trying to be mean. We're trying to show you that you're asking how does this relate to this and we're going to show you all the things you know in between by asking you a series of questions to get you there. And by doing so, let you see the actual connection as opposed to giving you an answer and missing the connection. Okay, Socrates uh, gets in trouble. Uh, he's charged with corrupting the morals of the, the youth and introducing new gods. What happens is some very powerful, influential people, uh, through his questioning and answering thing and showing the flaws in their logic, he gets them upset and they have him charged with this. Okay, he's condemned to death, and he can offer a counter. Uh, uh, sentencing, he's, uh, besides paying, uh, being condemned to death, he says, I'll pay a small fine. Okay. Traditionally, you would say, uh, how about you exile me? And in fact, others often to uh, smuggle him out, uh, rescue him. But instead, he says, okay, I'm going to do what the law says. And the law says I have to be, uh, you know, condemned to death. Then that's what's going to happen to me. Okay. And that's what he does. He, however, taught this guy here, Plato. Plato, okay, he's the first to use the term philosophy, which is actually the love of knowledge. Okay, and he founded a school called the Academy. Some folks will call this the first university. Um, possibly uh, didn't want to run into trouble with being in the streets and upsetting people. So if you come to my Academy and get made fan of, you had it coming because you actually came here. Okay, he taught everything, astronomy, biology, mathematics, political theory, and philosophy about the love of knowledge and learning itself. Okay. Plato also okay, uh, had a theory that truth or good exists beyond the physical world. He's that guy with the idea of ideal forms. Okay? And that's part of the reflection of Greek society in that sense of a sense of beauty and idealism in terms of how things are, but also not just in human beings, but also in life and ideas. He wrote a book called The Republic, which uh, describes what he refers to as a just sort of city state. Uh, another book called The Symposium, which describes the nature of love. And from that nature of love, we get the idea of love, not romantic love, but love for someone as another human being, we refer to as platonic love. Now, Plato is the teacher of someone else that we also know, this guy, Aristotle. Okay? Aristotle, he says that form and matter are joined. Unlike Plato, which says there are these sort of ideals, he says, no, uh, there aren't ideals. There's only what there is, and there's good examples of something and maybe bad examples, but the, not necessarily uh, an ideal perfection that's out there. Okay? He also uses this thing called Deductive inferences, okay? Drawing conclusions from an accepted premise by means of logical reasoning, okay? If this is so, then this and this, and getting you to those steps, making those connections by pointing out how they're logically connected, okay? He also set up a set of rules for the scientific method, although we won't call it that yet until much later uh, in, in the Enlightenment time period, but something kind of similar dates back all the way to Aristotle, okay? Aristotle also, Aristotle also okay, taught Alexander the Great. So we got Socrates teaches Plato, and it's Plato who writes down Socrates' information. 
Plato teaches Aristotle, Aristotle teaches Alexander the Great, Alexander the Great will see later goes and takes over a vast huge empire and spreads Greek knowledge all over the uh, Middle East and parts of the known world called Hellenistic culture. That's why we still know about these guys. Okay, He is the biggest influence in terms of his uh, ideas on politics uh, and Western ideas of thought. His books include such things as rhetoric, poetics, metaphysics, and politics. Okay, let's look at the other thing we've talked about in class, and this is the idea of Greek architecture and their buildings. We said, hey, we know religion is important because the most important building in town is a religious temple. Okay, well, throughout their time period, Greek style and uh, buildings uh, changes over time, and they have this, but they develop this golden mean, this ideal, this two to one ratio in terms of uh, your rise of your run. Uh, ask your geography teacher and she'll, or geometry teacher, and she'll tell you about that. But we have three orders of columns, okay? And the oldest is the Doric. And we see this column is much uh, bigger, not very ornate. The entablature here is actually what we call a, uh, this region in here from the top of the column up to the, the roof line. And we have these frases in through here, and they are broken up. Uh, and this is actually the kind of uh, what you would see at the um, Parthenon in uh, Athens. However, if you want to see the little relief statues that were in there, you'd have to actually go to the British Museum in London because that's where they are. Ask for Lord Elgin's marbles, okay? Later on, when you get a little more complex, you realize that column doesn't need to be that big and that dense and that heavy. We have a taller column, more open uh, air coming through here. Uh, our uh, freses now here are continuous as opposed to being disrupted over here. The capital here is this sort of scroll work design on it, okay? That's Ionic, Doric plane. Ionic, the scroll kind of design, and finally the Corinthian, taller yet still, and it's very sculpted, elaborate uh, type of capital on theirs. Okay, so here's some examples. Uh, this is some Doric architecture here. Uh, the simplest and earliest, this is again, as I said, using the Parthenon, uh, built around 447 to 432 BC. Uh, this is where they devise that idea of rules of proportion. It's impressive, it's solidarity, a uh, sense of s being very solidly built. Okay, and again, you can see here's that division between those, but again, these are missing. Go to London, they got them there. When you walk in the museum, say, hey, look at all this cool stuff you guys stole. Again, here's our Parthenon from a little bit different uh, view. Uh, was in great shape until the Venetians in here, uh, uh, Turkish gunpowder during the Venetian siege blew up. Um, it was a church at one time, it was a mosque at one time, and as I said, lasted until 1687. Oh my goodness, what a shame, what a waste. Okay, here's some Ionic uh, architecture here. You can see again our scroll type looking columns here on the top. Okay, taller and more slender. Capitals, as I said, resemble real scrolls. This is part of a, a monumental gateway to the Acropolis in Athens, so behind that you would see, uh, further up you would see where uh, actually the Parthenon um, uh, is. Okay, continuing on with Ionic uh, columns, this is the Temple of Athena Nike in Athens. It uh, was built around the 420s BC uh, time frame. Uh, again, classic icon Ionic temple, rather, uh, with Ionic columns and that continuous frez up here, okay, in the frieze. Uh, not the broken up one like we saw in the, the Parthenon. Okay, Corinthian is the most elaborate type of column. Uh, these are much taller, uh, much thinner. These are actually uh, sculpted in such a way as to um, make them look, they're curved, but they're made to make them look straight from a distance. Okay, this is used mostly for interior columns and later for temple exteriors because uh, the fine detail made them too easy to be damaged just in weather events. Uh, this is the temple of Zeus uh, in Athens. Uh, as you see, built much later, the other one's around 400 BC. This is 174 BC and finished in AD 132. Okay, looking at theater, this is uh, the Greek theater, um, a classic Greek theater. There's sort of half, not quite actually a half circle, it's a, a semicircle. Uh, in fact, um, when we later look at Rome, we'll see that the Colosseum is like two half Greek theaters and sort of an oval shape, not exactly a circle. 
Um, this is the theater in uh, Eupiterus, uh, finished about 350 BC. It's a late classical structure, which means it had stone benches, not wooden benches like earlier theaters. Um, right here, we see this little sort of area of the stage behind, or area behind the stage. This would have been structures with columns and stuff. It's sort of the backstage area, and here are the wings uh, of a traditional stage today. Okay, but of course, in Greece, all good things must come to an end. Okay, Sparta and Athens worked together to defeat the Persians during the uh, the Persian Wars. And that works out well to help uh, unify the states in the short term. But once their common enemy is gone, they become enemies eventually of each other. Okay, they turn on them as that common enemy is defeated. Okay, something we might see in some place like say, oh, Afghanistan. Anyway, um, this will lead to what we refer to as the Peloponnesian War. Okay, all good things must come to an end. Continued here. This is the Peloponnesian War. Okay, we're talking about the Peloponnesian League, which is led by Sparta against, uh, excuse me, who has a very strong army, and they are fighting against the Delian League, led by Athens, with a very strong navy. Now, originally the Delian League was a group of city-states with the goal of defending against any future Persian attacks. However, they moved the treasury from one of the off-islands to Athens, and they sort of become the controllers of the Delian League and other city-states, especially for Sparta, get upset about that, okay? Sparta will eventually win this war. It takes 27 years for this war to finish. It ends democracy as sort of being tried in uh, Athens, and eventually it won't be tried again for about 2,000 years, okay? What happens is Sparta, who has a strong army but no navy, gets money to form a navy, oddly, from the Persians, and goes in and defeats them. Okay, looking at some artwork here, I also wanted to show you, we talked about in class a little bit. Uh, this is Nike uh, Samothrace here, the, the winged goddess of victory. Uh, as you can see, damage here, the, the arms are missing as well as the head. And this is Venus de Milo, which is uh, uh, Aphrodite. Uh, Venus being the, the Roman term for that. Uh, and you see this uh, idea of classical female beauty, but again, we're missing the arms. Okay. One last thing, I want to come back here to the uh, ancient Greeks here. Uh, realize people kind of say, 27 years, Mr. Pulley, I don't understand how a war takes that long. You've got to understand back then it takes much longer to build the ships, move people around, prepare, uh, everything else. And so battles back then or wars back then are much different than today. There's a major battle and it might be months, several months, uh, up to a year before the next big battle in that war. So wars take a much longer time period than they do today. Okay, that's it for Greece. I uh, hope that helps you guys with your study guides, and we'll be checking those on Tuesday. So good luck, and see you in class.